Shadowverse. Greetings, I'm Shad, and I'm a massive castle enthusiast, having made many videos on the topic, from the uh, names of the parts of a castle, what are the types of castle, to more specific videos like what are machiculations, and why do some castle towers have different angles to their roof lines. But I've never made a video going through what I feel are the top 10 castles that I have come across in all my research, so let's get into it. The first castle is Corf Castle. It's absolutely one of my favorite because it's one of the best examples of a multi-ward castle. So a multi-ward castle is a castle that has multiple wards or baileys. So the ward or bailey is the section of castle that is enclosed by the castle wall. It can sometimes be connected to the keep or enclose the keep entirely. And a multi-ward castle is one that has multiple wards or baileys that you need to travel through to get to the primary fortified section of the castle or primary fortified residence, the keep. Corf Castle in on its later and final renovations had four wards or baileys. You needed to travel through four to get to the primary keep. It has a beautiful location situated on a very high prominent hill which nullifies the effectiveness of uh, many siege weapons. It is a basic square keep but it is also buttressed and the buttresses add additional stability but also visual flair. And there are kind of smaller attachments to the primary square keep giving more room and also visual style. I also love that it has more prominent windows on its upper stories, showing that you can have larger windows in castle design so long as they are high enough up, making it more difficult for any enemies to get access to. Or if the windows are facing the internal sections of a ward or bailey, that means that they're also protected enough to warrant or justify them being present. Corf Castle is such a beautiful castle and I wish I could have seen it in its heyday. It was truly an impressive beast of a castle, although the second castle on this list might give it a run for its money, and that is Castle Goyard. Built by Richard the Lionheart to maintain control over his holdings in Normandy, Chateau Goyard has such a unique design. Not only does its primary keep have some of the largest machicolations on any castle I have seen, and you know how much I love machicolations, it actually falls into multiple definitions due to its impressive and unique design. It is not only a linked castle, meaning that its primary keep is actually linked to the outer wall, it is also a concentric castle, having an outer wall entirely encircling an inner wall which forms a bailey around another bailey. It is also a multi-ward castle, meaning it has multiple wards and baileys as well. This castle is amazing and also a bit insane in its design. Not only only do you have to go through multiple wards or baileys to get to the primary inner section, that being three, the first ward or bailey could be considered a separate castle entirely because it's fully separated from the rest of the castle and you need to access the rest of the castle via a bridge. This first bailey can actually be classified as a towered castle. It's keeps and internal structures being formed by towers that are connected via a wall. But this first bailey isn't a castle on its own. It is a primary access point to the larger one, making it an additional ward or bailey to the overall castle design. Chateau Goyard really is one of the most unique and impressive castle designs I've ever seen. Next is the Cracked Chevalier, the most epic crusader castle. It is truly immense, one of the largest castles on this list. It's technically a concentric castle, meaning a castle within a castle, where it has a wall entirely encircling a inner wall, and the inner walls or castle of the Cracked Chevalier is large enough. This thing is massive. It's also very distinctive of Crusader castles which were all built more flat and squat to the type of castles that you find in Europe, primarily due to the fact that wood was a resource that was much harder to find. To have additional levels in their towers and keeps meant that they had to have fully vaulted ceilings to have additional floors going up, which is a difficult process. It results in a very sturdy castle, but it takes a lot of time to build these types of structures. And so Crusader castles usually had two, at most, levels in their towers and keeps. They might have gotten away with a third here and there. Of course, in its heyday, the Cracked Chevalier was riddled with machicolations and battlements. The primary access to the castle is via a bridge. It's on a very prominent hill outlooking this area. And by the way, fortifications were built in this location for a very long time going back. They were just added to and renovated over the years, resulting in the final state of the Cracked Chevalier, which was this epic and amazing crusader castle. Next, we have Horstewitz. Sorry about the pronunciation. I'm not good with the German pronunciation, but Horstewitz Castle is amazing. 
It has 14 gates or gatehouses that you need to travel through up this incredible location to reach the primary keep. What's really unique about Hot Ostevitz is that the keep itself isn't necessarily such a unique castle. If you were to take away the walls, it would actually look like a type of uh, fortified manor house. The keep doesn't actually have many battlements, but it doesn't necessarily need them because it's surrounded by battlements and fortified towers. It would be so difficult to reach the central keep of this castle. Also, look at the height of this hill. It is so defensible and would be insanely difficult to besiege because it would basically be impossible to get siege engines close enough, especially through all the layers of defense. Hoostevitz really demonstrates in one of the most extreme ways the philosophy behind castle defense, and that is layering the defense. Force the enemy to go through defensive barrier after defensive barrier. It is probably the most warded, multi-warded castle I have ever seen. Next, we have the Chateau de Pierrefonds. This is probably the most iconic representation of late French-style castle design. This style of castle was one of the more primary inspirations of the classic fairy tale style castles that we see often depicted in Disney films, or indeed just the Disney castle. It wasn't the only primary inspiration, Castle Neuschwanstein being another primary inspiration, but Neuschwanstein isn't actually a true fortified castle. Pierre Fons most certainly is. Because don't be fooled by its fairy tale kind of design, this is a very dangerous castle when it comes to defences. You might be thinking it has fewer crenellations, but that's only because the first line of crenellations actually has a roof line attached to them. See the machiculated battlements on the walls and the towers? Those squares you see are functionally identical to the crenelles on classic crenellations but instead of being exposed, they have a roof line, which actually leads to a second battlement line on the towers and walls. This castle literally has double battlements on its walls and towers, but just designed in such a visually amazing and beautiful way. Chateau de Pierrefonds represents almost the pinnacle of fortified functional castle design, reaching its climax in both its defensive capacity and its visual grandeur. The next castle I have a lot of trouble pronouncing. It is Castle Elo, I think. But although I have a lot of trouble pronouncing this castle, I have admired it for a very long time. And you might be wondering why I'm including it. There's not much left in regards to its ruin, but when you see what this castle was like when it stood strong, there's actually a lot to love about this castle. First, it is vastly more representative of castles of the period. These larger imposing castles that I've shown on the list so far are actually more the exception in terms of castle size than representing the norm. They're certainly on the list because of how impressive and incredible they are, being so large and fortified, but only the richest of the rich, usually kings themselves, are able to build such castles. For the castles of the more common lord, Castle Elo, again, bad pronunciation, as I said, is vastly more representative. The primary keep usually having enough space inside for a single room, maybe two. But even with how small it is, it is still an enclosed castle, meaning the keep is enclosed by a full wall, as well as being a multi-ward castle on top of it. It's also rather unique for having a very distinct fortified tower that is separate to the primary fortified living quarters. This being a fortified donjon, fortified tower, and a fortified keep. This is more commonly found in Germanic style castles, yet we have a perfect example in this Welsh castle. I just love it for its simplicity, but also how it is more representative of castle sizes of the period, but yet still unique for its design and its layout. Next is Chateau de Polerons, and if you thought my German pronunciation was bad, well, here's my French. But what I love about Polerons is location. One of the first and primary things to consider when you're building a castle is location. The greatest defensive advantage you can give a castle is where you put it. And just look at Polaron's location. It is incredible. It is epic. It would almost be impossible to besiege just by virtue of its location, let alone it's having battlements and defensive towers on top of it. I am just in awe 
awe of this location, but that is also representative of this philosophy. It's not the only type of castle that has such an insane and amazing location like this. Indeed, if you look up the Katha castles, many of them have similarly impressive locations like this. Polarons is just my favourite among them, and it's on the list because of its representation of such an important philosophy in castle design. Location, location, location. Next we have Hermitage Castle, a semi-ruined castle in the borders of Scotland, and one of the reasons why it's on this list is it is such a beautiful example of the unwalled castle. There's been a misconception that I've worked hard to debunk, and it's the idea that a castle has to have a wall around it. This is so historically inaccurate. Not at all. There were many castles throughout history that did not have a wall around them, and they were just a single fortified building. And Hermitage Castle is a perfect example of this, as well as being an example of a type of tower house. Also, instead of just having a kind of single square footprint, it is more diverse and unique in the shape of its footprint, giving it a more distinct look. It also has a very interesting aspect to it, where historically we presume that it had an attached hoarding built around it, giving it higher defensive functional ability. This would give defenders a platform to be able to shoot down on anyone that is hugging the line of the wall beneath. Usually castles of this period would just have stone-built machicolations which would achieve the same purpose, but instead it actually has functionally useless but visual types of smaller machicolations that are just there for aesthetics that are running along the top line of the castle. The designer is choosing to go with classic hoardings instead of stone machicolations, but still liking the visual style of those machicolations and adding in smaller aesthetic ones. It's, that's just a very interesting element that makes me like the castle even more. Next is Karlstein and Oh my goodness, I love this castle. Located in the Czech Republic, it is very representative of the Germanic kind of style of castles that were very prominent within the entire Germanic regions. One of the more distinctive features of this style is that its uppermost floor of the towers are actually made out of wood with a very high angled roof. But not only high angled, it actually has two angles on the roof line. Why are they built like that? Well, I have a dedicated video explaining, but it gives such a unique look that I personally love. In addition to its unique visual flair, look at its size. It is incredible, imposing, impressive. It actually has two keeps and, of course, a defensive fortified wall around it with buildings and towers attached to that outer wall. The medieval Germanic architectural style is often overlooked in kind of castle designs in modern media such as fantasy and things like that, which I feel is a true shame because I love this design style. And Castle Karlstein is one of the most impressive and beautiful representations of it. And finally, last on the list, we have Bodium Castle, one of my all-time favourite. It is a beautiful representation of a towered castle, meaning a castle that is formed by its outer wall and all buildings and rooms are actually built as sections or attachments to that wall. It's basically a castle that is a wall and towers, hence the towered castle. But Bodium is particularly beautiful when you look at the silhouette from the approach of its front entrance. It has variety in its towers. The primary gatehouse also functions as the most prominent tower as well, meaning that the tower that you would most clearly define as the keep is also the gatehouse. It is surrounded by such an amazing water-filled moat, giving prominence to the castle and making it very distinctive. It also represents a bit of a transitional period in castles, where they started to focus more on the livability and comfort on castle, but not wanting to throw away or give less emphasis on the importance of its defensive ability as a military structure. And so we see a kind of combination between those two philosophies in Bodium. One of the signs of this is the sheer amount of internal fireplaces it has to try and give greater warmth and comfort to as many rooms as possible inside of it. I love the variety and creativity with the machicolation of battlements on the primary gatehouse and as I mentioned the silhouette is one of the most beautiful of any castle I have seen and there we go these are my top 10 castles and this is actually a very difficult list to make because there are so many castles that I love and are particularly unique so if you like this video perhaps I'll be able to make another one for you thank you very much for watching I hope you've enjoyed and of course I hope to see you here on the next video on Shadowversity until that time farewell